Simon de Carpentry, a French citizen, um, computer science engineer with 15 years uh, of experience as a web artisan and also a lot of experience as um, an online militant activist um, with big French associations uh, and also maybe the one you know, La Quadrature du Net, during five years have been making the press review of La Quadrature du Net, and during this time I dreamt about a tool that could uh, save me 80% of my work clicking back and forth <laughs> from the newspapers to the press review. And I did not find this tool existing. I complained a lot about this tool not existing, and after some years I finally um, I finally had the idea to just make it. That's how it uh, started. So it's a press engine. Uh, it's a, it's a um, search engine. Looks like every regular search engine. You put your terms, you click on the bottom, and the results are over. Um, it's in fact a meta search engine, so it's very uh, easy to understand, you put your request and the tool will uh, fetch results from now more than 500 uh, newspapers online using their own internal search feature. Um, for this to work in a web, con in a web uh, context, um, I needed to shape it as a web extension to gain more privilege and be able to fetch um, online content from something else that your own uh, uh, URL uh, and to present it to you um, on, your, on, your, on, on your web browser. Um, so here are some use cases. Why you do need uh, search engine to look into newspapers, into online newspapers. Um, you can be making a press review, but you could also be uh, monitoring a scientific area. Uh, there are more than uh, 10 sources of MetaPress among the 500 I already spoke about. 10 sources that are scientific um, editors with uh, online uh, uh, presence. Um, but um, everything you would do with Google News, you can do with MetaPress, because MetaPress is a kind of a hack of Google by the outside, <laughs> and it provides comparable results, but without the servers and without the monitoring of everyone. Um, the tool is already able to fetch quite impressive quantities of results, and it takes not so longer, not so long to do. Um, and it provides more than just what Google News uh, is offering you, because you can custom the searches you can select in which sources you will uh, in which newspaper you will search you can select them by group or one by one and so you know where it has been searching for and where it was not searched uh, while with the google news you should believe that they search everywhere and you can't check it um, the tool also let you uh, reschedule something that was a good search. You click on the button and you decide if, if the search should pop up on your web browser every day, every week, when you want for La Quadrature du Net. For me, to continue my work at the press review, I have just four of them, 
when I arrive at 9 in the morning and just at 11.30 before the break and I have four in the day, I'm sure I won't miss any news, any result. Um, so the main advantage is, is that you win all the time that you should spend to query all the newspaper one by one. Your computer do, does this and it does this very fast. Um, there's no um, private life threats um, because you can check what the tool does. It's a free software. You can check what are the queries just looking at the um, uh, dev tool of your web browser. You can see that the tool is only querying the newspapers you want. And I present, this tool presents you the results without loading any side content. No tracking, no advertisement, no pixel uh, hidden. Uh, it's like the NLNet said, it helps you to um, escape the swamps of uh, third parties. Um, also, if you do twice the same search, hopefully you will obtain twice the same results and in the same order. And unfortunately, it's not the case with all the other main uh, commercial tool to do this. They want to trick the order, they want to decide what's on the first page and what's not, they want to put some ads between. It's not the case with this tool. Uh, your phone, if you run the software on your phone, will be powerful enough to sort all the results in chronological order. If that's what computers are doing the best, it's a pun that works in French because in French we don't do computer, it's not computing machine, it's ordering machine. We, we said ordinateur. Um, so it's a lot customizable and sure, it's fully decentralized uh, architecture. architecture. Um, it's your computer that works. When you install Metapress, your computer suddenly learn how to query all these newspapers. Nothing is going to Metapress servers. There is no Metapress servers. It's easy to check. No need to come by me to check what the uh, servers are doing. There's no servers. You are sure to be uh, protected. Also, it means that there won't be easy sensor censorship on the tool. It's globally impossible to censor because you, you, you can block one newspaper in one country, but you won't block all uh, the thing. Um, it also means that if tomorrow all, even if now all of you are trying to download the thing and install it, I won't uh, sleep bad because uh, it's your computer that works and my servers won't be uh, on the knees because four million people uh, start to use it from one day to another. Um, this uh, decentralized architecture means that uh, the more people use it, the more computers are running it, and it needs no new equipment on the network. I, I, I don't need to put more servers and more and more servers and to put my data centers on the Arctic Polar Circle uh, like Google. Um, there's no servers, it's existing machine that just learn to do new things. So how to get it? Uh, it's a web extension for Firefox. So just head on to addons.mozilla.org and click the Add to Firefox button. This one, my, my favorite. Um, it will ask you two questions. It will wait for a few seconds and then it will ask you if you really want to install it. Just click yes. And then after, very important, it will, it will ask you if you uh, want to run it in private mode. My first move would be, I don't know what it is, I click no and I will see later. But unfortunately, if you take the problem from another side, you're just going through the preferences of Firefox and you see, uh, always use private mode. Or why not? I want to, to have some private life, so I click on this button. And it ends up with, 
you installing something that won't show up because you clicked not in should I you allow it to um, uh, run in private mode. That's that's the, the only thing that can go wrong, and people say, I installed it and nothing happened. Bad news, but not. It's not exactly my fault. You should see a new icon in your toolbar with a, a, a nice butterfly net catching falling stars. It's the news in the newspaper, the falling stars, and, and MetaPress is the fly net. It works also very good in uh, in uh, inter browser. If you don't have this icon, either you did not allow it in private mode, or it's behind the the small uh, sandwich things, la, burger icon. Uh, but the icon is somewhere. I just click on the icon, and it will open the press the the third engine you've seen. To finish, some limits. Um, it, it's it's not the cyber blade that will do everything. I try hard, but um, I can only add sources to the tool if the sources provide a meaningful date on each result. It means two things. A newspaper that would use a search engine that, not, that is not printing the date of an article in uh, the, the results, the page of the results of the search engine, I could not integrate this because I don't have the dates and I, can, I cannot search. It also means that an online agenda, for instance, uh, a militant agenda that say uh, there will be protests there and over there, and um, this, like uh, Mobilizon, the tool from Framasoft, can be used and can be integrated and queried with this tool because the results will be sorted by chronological order. It works. Um, so you can query with this tool the 30 instances of the demosphere.org um, online militant agenda. And it's the only way on earth to do this. It's not very useful because the different instances are for different areas. But still, if you want to search something, it's possible. Um, I need a date on the results. Uh, I only can search through through known uh, sources. Currently, there are 538 sources that you can query with the tool. Only this one can be queried because it requires to produce a, a set of des some description of the two of the source for. MetaPress to know how to fetch the results from it. So that's a limitation. Uh, we will need more uh, volunteers to help us to map the world, to discover all the newspapers of the world, because it's the aim. Currently, there are newspapers from 50 countries, 59 languages, because I head first for the newspaper of records found in the corresponding Wikipedia page. Uh, and then I am doing French things because I am a French people. But for instance, the Egyptian newspapers, I'm sure there are some great of them, but I can't just understand what I see on the, on the main page. So we need to instruct MetaPress uh, about new, new sources. Uh, I also currently can't fetch old archives. Uh, scientists, for instance, they would like to be able to deep dive into a subject and to fetch old results. And for the moment, the tool is only capable of fetching the results of the first page of the, of the search engine. Uh, and maybe, maybe one day uh, the tool will improve, but it's not planned yet. Uh, it's a meta search engine, so the search uh, are taking quite some time. In fact, you see the first result coming in the first millisecond, so you don't see that it's long. But to, to comply the completely, the search will take about 20 seconds. It's still not uh, long enough to print your keyboard in your face like Neo in Matrix. Um, it's not a website, should have been, should have been better. 
if it have been a website, but I need the special privilege. Uh, and there's no email notification, uh, but you have in-browser notifications. Do you have any questions? Yes, I can move. Yeah. So for people with questions, there are microphones okay. along the, okay. the line. So Simon can stay up here. Thank I you for the beautiful talk, Simon. Okay. And if anyone has questions, uh, the microphones in the middle are available for questions, and then Simon okay. can stay up yeah. here and answer them. A very brief one. Uh, there are uh, journals with uh, behind the paywall, like the New York Times. How do you get in? Do I get through the paywalls? No. I am not giving you access to the content of the article. I am just giving you access to the knowledge of the existence of the article. Um, there exist tools to go through paywalls, but my aim is to reinforce the freedom of press. My aim is to get the journalist a living. And, um, they are, I don't want to circumvent their business models. Behind the paywalls is not a web, the web anymore, but you know it exists, and you, you might just reach the guy and, and ask for the content or something. That's a great question and a great answer. Um, the next one. Uh, hi. Um, my question is, do you have a lot of problems with the sources changing the way they send you data back? That's a great question. And it's sure a weakness of my model. Uh, the short answer is no. It moves slowly. So from time to time, one newspaper is changing his, uh, his appearance but they might just change the CSS and not the structure, and that would be great for me. It happens, but it's not a threat for the project. Another answer is that a lot of newspapers are providing their results on the RSS format. You can query it and uh, register for the RSS field. A lot of newspapers, it's not something good from them because they thought about us. It's just because by default in WordPress you get the feature. And hundreds and hundreds <laughs> are using WordPress by default with this feature, even if they are not um, displaying it. I check, will it pop up? How oh, it gets and up next. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Can we uh, have a big applause for Simon? Come back on Monday, 10 a.m. here for the long presentation. Yes, so if you want to know more, he's giving another talk on Monday here. How, at what time? 10 a.m. 10 a.m. Okay, so that was beautiful. The next speaker can already stand there while um, I do my little announcements. So who's the next speaker? Okay, so uh, I just wanted to let you know we are doing something about the heat. There are people working to get the tent open, to get ventilation, because it is way too hot in here. So don't forget to drink water, put on sunscreen, even though it's, we're in a tent. Um, and then for the next speaker. Uh, his, two, and My name is Jaap van um, his name is Jaap van Til, and he's going to give you a, I imagine, a really nice talk. Have fun. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I have uh, 10 minutes to save the world, so I will be fast and not uh, uh, use. The, nice. I don't have slides because I was invited yesterday to, to do this, and I can do it from. Uh, is it. Uh, can you hear the. Okay. The, the title is The Liebig Law Method to Build Networks. And you will say, The Liebig Method? Whatever is that? I will explain. Well, first the problem we are going to solve together, I hope, is caused by massive interconnection of everything we have built in the world. There is appearing a lot of complexity. Everything is interrelated. It's, it's our fault also because we have connected all these things. But so if there is a single issue, a crisis, a lot of other fields are involved and should be involved too. Second thing is it most of these crises like energy, climate, migration, etc., etc., 
are a worldwide issue. I, I have big uh, uh, respect for uh, the uh, people of uh, some uh, groups who ag agitate against uh, uh, big companies spoiling our uh, nature, but the, the jurisdiction is still national. And that's silly because it, is, it should be a planetary issue. And we have to approach it in a planetary way. Now, since hackers know what they are talking about, learn very fast together, and get things working, yeah, it's very positive usually, they can make, they, they know what they are talking about. They can, if they combine their efforts, can repair and Im improve things. So after the apocalypse, which is now, yeah, and if you look at the meaning of apocalypse means revelation, it's not only a disaster, it is, uh, there are revelations coming, I hope I give you one today, is we have to take action, we have to do certain things. And how do we do that? With the Liebig law method. Mr. Justus Lieb von Liebig was a German chemical man. In 1850, I think, everybody in the world was asking, how can we improve crop yield? Because there were famines. And some people said, more sunlight, more water, more fertilizers, more uh, working at the soil. And he said, yes, it's, all of them are right. But there's always one factor which inhibits everything. It's like if you are in a congestion in the road, the first car in the, in the congestion def def defines the speed of the congestion. So politicians shouldn't make all kinds of fantastic measures which work the other way around in sometimes the opposite results uh, from complex systems, they should go from one bottleneck to the other and take away bottlenecks, take away obstructions. That's what we do in networks. Something is always stopping the traffic. And we have to find those spots where it is congested do something about it, or bypass it, or tunnel it. A lot of talks you will hear this week uh, or these days are about such measures to zoom into obstructions. But there's one downside. If you take away one ob obstruction, the obstruction will move to another place. The, s the, the, the car which is was keeping the, the, the flow from moving, if you take that, if, if they can f go faster, there's another car which takes over the silly role of looking at the traffic, blah, 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 and everybody's waiting behind them. So it is, you have to continue looking at obstructions where they occur, zoom in, and together with a lot of hackers, help it flow again, help it to move, and that's a very positive activity. With that, we can construct worldwide collective intelligence with decentral authority to act, so it is no longer a central complex system with one government or one group of managers who control everything. Now we see the, these people having enormous attacks of controlaholics. They want to have everything under control, which is fiction. So, um, you have permission to help build the global brain from such a construction with a lot of people who work together to get things moving. And then we will have to get more than 10 to the power 10, it's 10 billion connected people on this planet which form a global brain and our planet will wake up 
it's Gaia is going to move and it's about now it, it 10 billion people bacteria already have more than a trillion bacteria they also exhibit this collective intelligence so br our brains contain brain cells which is much more than t t uh, than 10 billion so the, the puzzle how we can get conscious is at a certain threshold of that number of connected things so let's help to connect the world and the people on this planet and just disregard what managers and governments say thank you well Thank you for that beautiful talk. I'd never heard of that before. If there are any questions, we have mics in the um, lane in the middle. So if you have a question, just walk up to there, and then uh, I think Jan can answer it. Also, the next speaker can already stand up and uh, go attach their laptop or anything. I write about these uh, things in my blog, which is called deconnectivist at wordpress.com. So please read my blog, and then you get it explained in length. Thank you. Please pose your question, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I've got a question regarding how complex systems actually work. Given that uh, these kinds of systems do require uh, information exchange be between agents, uh, your proposal is the following, that every agent uh, at some point will gain the whole knowledge about the system, otherwise we won't be able to control the whole system. Do you believe it's not a dystopian vision then? Well, the, the point is that you can build a collective intelligence. For instance, in our brain, it is a miracle that we can see very clear pictures because the lenses are not in our eyes, the watery balls, but the lenses are in our brain. It's processed. Mm -hmm. It's, con uh, it's uh, uh, well, you, you can store certain things in, a, if you make transforms of it, and, and uh, you can also do correlations, uh, matching. Mm -hmm. So we are looking very carefully at how brains are constructed. We don't know very much about it, People have been either looking at those uh, <coughs> construction have, and having re it's image processing. It's uh, senses combined, combine information from various sources, which has to be uh, uh, in a in a group. And there are all kinds of dangers. Uh, there are also fascists can organize themselves in that way. Mm -hmm. And we have already seen some ex uh, examples of uh, being very well organized right wing people, for instance. But they usually have uh, people who are very um, loyal to the leader and are not selected for their abilities. While we as hackers select people on their abilities, on their, if they are competent. In all these uh, uh, political parties, there are very incompetent people at the top, and that is not a very durable solution. Even presidents who have been incompetent, and maybe the, the, the financial rich people have controlled that, but now again, the, the Tories in England have selected a lady who is really has a peanut for brains. I mean, sorry that I'm a bit rude, but I'm from the Netherlands, and we, we are not polite. Sorry, I will not add more to this, this disastrous discussion, but we have to work together with people who are really competent, who really know how computers work, who really can network, and connect to each other and work together to build this global brain. Yeah. Well, I yeah. think that's a great message to end it with. Could we get another applause?
Yeah. So um, the next person I'm going to introduce is Max, and he is going to give a very interesting talk on a topic I cannot explain the title of because I physically can't pronounce the words. But I'm sure he can. So um, before I re after I repeat, drink your water, and we're trying to do something about the heat, he is going to give a beautiful talk on it. Have an applause for Max. I think I have some technical issues. Somehow. Let's hmm? plug it in, it works shortly, and then and it goes blank. Okay. While we are preparing, I can show you. Okay. No, um, much. Yeah, but it's, it's going away in a second, I think. Yes. Uh, is this true? Oh, there are people who know more than I do. Uh, would you like to do a Q&A after some people ask you questions? Yeah, I'll write it here. Yeah, and um, would you like me to remind you of how long you've taken or not, how long you still have left? Uh, I think I'll move the quick. Great. We are we're still working on the issue of getting the laptop, but in the meantime, get to sign up as an angel. There I go. Um, I turned it off myself. <laughs> so while uh, there are some technical things happening I don't know too much about, don't forget to sign up as an angel. If you still want to, you get a beautiful water bottle, I left up my chair, and a lovely t-shirt. Also, if you do decide to do trash or parking shifts, which they're really nice, um, you get a gorgeous, gorgeous batch that you can adhere to pants or a vest, and they're really pretty. So um, don't forget to do that. Now, we're still not ready. Okay, um, don't worry. That is a great idea. Are, is that okay with you? Yeah. Well, come up. Who are you? Okay, my, my name is Michiel. Well, Michiel, and what are you giving a talk about? I'm going to talk about stickers and an Nelnet, that and sounds, about saving the internet. So it's actually sounds, a great combination of things. Yeah, well, good luck. Uh, applause for Michiel. Okay. So, I work for a charity, my name is Michi Lenaars, I work for a charity called NLNet Foundation. So this year we celebrate 40 years of trying to save the internet. Uh, so we first introduced it in Europe back in the day. Actually it's a bit of a, a, a fuck up and so we want to fix it uh, while we're still alive. And so, uh, one of the things that we do, we're, we're an ANBI, a public benefit organization. So we give money to people that develop open source software. Uh, and these people actually, uh, so, so First of all, maybe you are one of such persons. August 1st, you can again ask us for money. If you work in an open source project, just like Simon, uh, 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 who presented earlier, is one of our projects, but there are actually quite a few of them uh, over here at, uh, uh, at MCH. Um, cho choose a better life than working for a corporate overlord. Work uh, on free, open source, uh, free and open source software as much as you like, to, uh, code your heart out, and get paid for it. Basically, that's the formula. Um, but of course, when people do a project, they start making stickers. And you've, you've seen uh, many of the stickers uh, in, uh, alive. There's, there's whole tables of stickers. And uh, at a certain point in time, your laptop fills up. And this is, this is ordered re relatively neatly. But this is as much as it can take. Now, a couple of years ago, smart people came up with an idea. Why don't we standardize the stickers? So, I present you hexagon stickers. And just, just, just to make sure that we're not bullshitting, we brought about 50 or 60 different designs of hex stickers to the conference. You can get them at the Dutch hacker, uh, hacker spaces, uh, uh, space. 
and you can start your instant collection. And the cool thing about this is you can actually, if a project becomes uncool, they go closed source, they have Nazis in their team, uh, or they don't have Nazis in your team, whatever your thing is, you can actually <laughs> rip and replace it and uh, add cool new things that you want, which you couldn't possibly do with these 15 layers of stickers that keep getting your laptop heavier. Yeah. So the, the mission in short is, if you're a coder, come and uh, work for the internet, ask us at nlnet.nl, nlnet.nl. If you need a job, we are looking for a Rust coder, a communications person, and uh, we're also looking for a project manager. Get a job there as well. And uh, get as much stickers as you can. And please use this, uh, the, the, hex, uh, the hex standard for stickers. Two inch wide, uh, 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 the, the, the tip at the top. If you look for it on the internet, you will find the spec and it's so much better. It's a, it's a prettier and better world. So, I, yeah, that, that's basically it. Are, are, we, are we there yet? Okay. Okay, yes, well, uh, 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 the, the, the interesting thing about, uh, no. well, let, let, let's not do that. You can talk to me. The, the Dutch Hacker Spaces Village, there's like a big tent there and you can get unlimited supplies of, of, of stickers uh, uh, and get your instant click. Take them for your kids, take them for your friends, make better and prettier laptops. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. That was amazing. The next person up with, tech, uh, with everything working again is Max. Right? Yes. And he is going to talk about fuzzing of cryptographic protocols. So, a big applause for him. So, I will be talking about fuzzing of cryptographic protocols today. Um, so, I'm Max. Um, this project originally started um, in France, actually, um, at Inria Loria in Nancy. Um, so this was kind of my topic for my master thesis. Um, and right now I'm continuing this project at Trail of Bits, which is an awesome security company. So what's the deal actually? So in our modern world, we have, we already had several security issues in our World Wide Web. Um, these security standards are usually um, defined in what we call RFCs. So there are a lot of specifications out there. Um, so for example, there's RFC 5246. So there already have been a lot of proposals before that and also after that. Um, that happens to be the specification for TLS, which is basically the protocol which makes our internet secure. Um, but just having a specification is not enough. Um, you need to have an implementation, something you run, something which runs on your phone, on your, on your laptop. Um, and this process is quite error prone. So by going from specification to an implementation, developers make mistakes and they will continue to make mistakes unless we let machines do the implementation, I think. Um, so there have been already quite a few security vulnerabilities which occurred during this path. Um, so what actually is fuzzing? Fuzzing is a method for testing implementations. So basically what you're doing is you're feeding just random data to programs um, and see how they react. See if they are crashing, see if they reach invalid states. So this is called black box fuzzing if you're, if you're just doing random inputs. If you're making it a little bit more intelligent, then you let your fuzzer learn um, to generate intelligent inputs by using some feedback from the implementation you're testing. Um, so this is very nice for testing simple tools like just the Linux command line tools, for example. Um, but it gets very difficult when, when fuzzing or testing cryptographic protocols because protocols, they don't just expect a single input. 
they expect a sequence of messages. Um, so it's not just plain binary data, which they expect. So the challenges are that previous um, cryptographic messages um, are important for the later steps in the protocol. Later messages in the protocol depend on earlier ones. And also, you're usually not only looking for crashes, but you're also looking for um, whether there are any logical bugs. For, exa for example, if an attacker somehow managed to bypass authentication um, or downgrade the security of the protocol. Um, an example protocol I've been working on is TLS, uh, which is quite old already. The earlier versions are very bad. Um, and right now we are using two modern ones, which are both quite secure, um, even though TLS 1.3 is recommended. So the big picture in the fuzzer is um, that the fuzzer generates some input. Um, and with this fuzzer, um, you don't generate just stupid random data, but you generate some structured data. So for example, here we have a client hello, server hello message. Those are two kinds of messages which are used in a protocol. Um, and you're already sending structured data. Um, and for example, here to open SSL. And then we're watching open SSL closely. What is it doing? Um, did any security violations occur? Did some attacker bypass the security of the protocol? Um, all of this is inspired by more formal protocol verification. Um, I cannot, sadly, I cannot go um, very deep into this, but basically the idea is to formally model what is the protocol, what messages exist, um, and in this model, basically the attacker is the network, so you're covering all the man-in-the-middle attack scenarios, um, so the attacker is able to inject messages, intercept messages, manipulate messages, so just like in real life. Conclusions are, um, so this fuzzer is actually able to generate a, a series of messages. Um, we can concretize these symbolic representations, these more high level representations to inputs which OpenSSL can understand, for example. Um, that way, for example, the fuzzer is able to decrypt messages. So um, if you would task a fuzzer to decrypt messages, this is kind of not possible with traditional fuzzing. Um, and the fuzzer is also able to de uh, detect and also that way rediscover previous vulnerabilities. So thanks for your time. Um, any questions? So can you, uh, can you actually, so there's a tool called VerifPal, which is a symbolic verification tool, which is used, being used to model TLS 1.2, TLS 1.3. Can you actually use the, these models to, to, as input, because they're formalized and, 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 and very structured? Um, so you mentioned ProVerif, right? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a tool yeah, laid yeah. on top of it to, to, to simplify development, but it essentially it's yeah. ProVerif. So it's actually the, the lab which I participated in uh, did develop ProVerif, or was developed there. I did take a look um, at these models in the very beginning. Um, and what you kind of pointed out is like the, the grand plan, which lies ahead several years in the future. So right now, it's a lot of work to um, get to the point where you can execute all of those um, tracers, tracers or messages. But in the end, we kind of want to have a fully automated tool, which just take some specification, for example, in ProVerif, and then does, it ma does its magic and finds all of the vulnerabilities in it. OK, August 1st, just, just apply for a project then, if it's a multi-year project. <laughs> yeah, all right. Then thank you very much for a very interesting talk. And uh, well, then we come right to our next speaker. And um, yeah, I actually have to take over from the Herald because she was running out of time, and just in case you're wondering. All right. So I have no slides, just some reminders of what I'm going to discuss uh, with you. So my name is Peter van Eyck. I have a couple of jobs, uh, they're mainly 
focused on instructing cloud security and cybersecurity. So who of you is involved in cybersecurity education in one way or another? Okay, cool. Um, any Dutch people among that? Okay, even cooler. So here's the thing that I'm working on uh, together with a couple of people. And um, the purpose of this short presentation is to see how we can work together uh, to create uh, an even better situation. Now, I don't think that I need to explain to this audience the importance of cybersecurity education. There's a growing demand, growing workforce, and if you have any data that's to the contrary, I definitely want to know. Um, I am, uh, one of my jobs is working as a hoofddocent at uh, Hogeschool Utrecht, and I'm responsible for the cybersecurity and cloud education there. Now, what we find is that in a formal education program, um, even in a formal education program, a gamified learning works really well, and many of you uh, know that as a capture the flag. And um, what we are starting to do, uh, together with a couple of Hogeschool in the Netherlands, is to build a common platform to run that on. Uh, the, the challenge is that an individual school does, doesn't have the resources to do that. Uh, either to run the platform or to generate enough learning content for that. So we're working on what we call the joint cyber range.nl, and you can actually look it up, it's live. Uh, it's a bit of a pun to the joint strike fighter, of course. And uh, the, uh, it's, it, it's in development. We're actually uh, working with uh, Surf and, and a couple of other interested um, collaborators to, to work on that. Uh, what I wanted to point out, and I have a few notes here, uh, I think I don't really need to explain to you how that is, is going to work um, because you know, who, 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 who works for CTF? You know, who, who, who has CTF experience, right? Um, who, who basically knows what a capture the flag competition is? I, I, I guess most of you, yeah, I see most of the hands. Right? Okay, now what we find is surprisingly hard to run that ourselves uh, or to, to, to run that in a, in a school environment. I mean, you can have commercial or, or non-profit uh, solutions for that, but they don't really interface with uh, student systems. Um, they, they don't allow for proper curation of the, of the content from the perspective of teachers and, and the universities. So uh, that's what we're working on. Uh, and we're not rebuilding everything ourselves. Um, our current prototype is actually based on a CTFD running in a Kubernetes cluster, very cool but we would be willing to ditch that if there's a better solution, and we're working on that as well. So, wrapping this up, uh, you all have other talks to go to. If you are just a little bit interested in um, moving cybersecurity education, uh, specifically higher education, but also primary and other levels of education ahead, either in the Netherlands or in Western Europe or in Europe, then come talk to me because we can definitely work together. Um, if you want to contribute content, that's also something that I really would be interested in, in figuring this out. And with that, um, are there any questions? Well, that's really... <laughs> First, thank you, and a big round of applause for our speaker here. And yeah, are there any questions for him? Uh, there are microphones in the middle, just walk up there. If not, uh, I don't think we actually have another speaker now. So